Hello again and welcome to chapter 5, Food and Agriculture. In this chapter we're going to look at the issues regarding the worldwide flu food distribution, um, the inac inaccessible nature of food in some areas, uh, sustainable practices when it comes to food, what needs to be done down in the future, and you know what can we do ourselves to help battle this problem. And this is a global problem. This isn't just America. This is a global issue. And that's what we're going to get talk about in terms of um, how much food is being produced, how much food is being wasted, uh, and then uh, again, some um, sustainable alternatives that we can use to go forward. Now, there's roughly 7 billion people on Earth, and the food that the world produces feeds about 85% of that population. However, that seems like a lot, but that still leaves about 1 billion people with a lack of adequate nutrition, especially in developing areas like Africa and India and Southeast Asia. It's just not producing enough food to meet the current needs of consumption. Now, the, the interesting fact about that is, from our perspective here in America, we go to a supermarket and we see just tons of food, right? But they, that's not the way it is in other parts of the world. That's where the inequalities exist in global consumption. Um, basically, it's said that a, a, an active male, a moderately active male, should get about 2,200 calories to 2,500 calories per day. Maybe we'll say 2,800 calories per day. Well, in America, that's bumped up to like 3,600 calories, why we have an obesity problem in this country. And in other areas of the world, let's say in parts of Africa, they're getting less than 2,000 calories a day. So th there's this huge inequality as to who's getting the food that's being produced. Now, the big stat is this last bullet point. One third of the food produced globally is wasted. One third. Now, I would be lying if I said my family doesn't waste a lot of food. I, I do all the cooking in my family. And it drives me nuts, but unfortunately, other than my oldest son, nobody, I, I, me and my oldest son will eat some leftovers, but my youngest son and my wife won't touch them. So I throw a lot of food away, a lot of food. But globally, I mean, this is a huge issue with restaurants, with everything. It's just a massive, massive problem. One of the issues being tackled, especially here in America, are what is, are known as food deserts. And you can see this map here that shows um, the, uh, where the food deserts are. And what a food desert is, it's an area within an urban or a rural area that doesn't have access to um, fresh, healthy, affordable food. And this is a real issue. Now, in my day job, so to speak, I teach what's called GIS, which is partially making maps. And I, I've seen this map here before. And what this is, is showing where these food deserts are. Now, what this means is, um, and how it uh, relates to, let's say, the obesity problem here in the United States is, there are areas that don't have fresh fruits and vegetables. Their only option is a convenience store that has prepackaged -pre processed foods. So that's all they eat. You know, you think chips and snacks and soda and all that kind of stuff. And that's literally their entire diet because they don't have the same access to walk into a supermarket maybe and uh, see you know fresh fresh fruits and vegetables. Now you can see from this map that a lot of the the very uh, troubled areas are in the south and southeast and the Appalachian area as well. So this is an issue that's been trying to be tackled from various areas trying to encourage businesses to move into these areas that, you know, at least semi-close to where people could maybe travel a short distance or even a medium distance to get to fresh foods, uh, fruits and vegetables. So before we talk about the future of agriculture in the, the world, let's take a step back and look at sort of the evolution of how the agricultural systems have uh, evolved over time. So the earliest humans were hunter-gatherers or foragers. Now hunter-gatherers are just that, they'd go out and they'd hunt animals and um, foragers are looking for uh, fruits on trees or berries or mushrooms or things like that 
foraging for whatever they could find. And then eventually around 10,000 years ago, um, the evidence shows that humans began to garden in the forest. Um, plants were cultivated, so replanted with seeds and to allow them to grow. Ultimately, this became sort of the domestication of forage plants, creating, uh, and because the plants stayed still, now the people stayed there as well. So back in the early hunter-gatherers, they would follow the herds. They were nomadic. They would move around. But once they started actually planting um, crops, they became more, sed the term is sedentary, or they stayed in one spot. The farms were small and remained that way until farming shifted from manual cultivation, as you can see in that middle picture there with the, uh, whatever that animal is, uh, pulling the plow, to what we see now in the upper picture with the big massive um, machinery that takes care of these huge agricultural farms. So because the machinery got better, the farms got bigger. And we're at the point now, again, where these farms are just massive, you know, and they, you know, they, they produce enormous amounts of fruits, grains, and vegetables and things like that. Starting in the post-World War II era of the 1950s, the Green Revolution development of sort of this notion of um, industrial food production. So going from so, sort of small family farms and over time gradually increasing and increasing those farms um, through the engineering of the plants and breeding along with chemicals that created higher yields, which means it allowed more grains to be harvested and even have more than one harvest in a season. You know, and then it just sort of kept going from there. And then, you know, agriculture is a billions and billions of dollar industry where you have better irrigation, better pesticides, fertilizers, and um, the science is all behind it as well. I mentioned in a previous slide, I teach what's called GIS, which is maps and things like that. And GIS is used a ton for what they call precision agriculture. So you have um, GPS units that show the tractor exactly where to be at all times. So there's no gaps in where things are planted or where things are fertilized to keep er everything down in terms of the amount of pesticides, fertilizers. It keeps costs down, it keeps yields up, and it it's quite a science. So this green revolution started a revolution <laughs> that still endures today. And we're gonna look at some of the positives and negatives of that green revolution. So the Green Revolution spurred cheap food. And what do I mean by that? Because you had bigger and bigger farms that were able to cultivate more and more, and then a lot of that went into industrial uses in terms of feeding uh, cattle and then going into things like cereals and stuff like that. You know, most of the corn that's being grown or wheat isn't going into bread, it's going into all kinds of things, you know, right? Things you wouldn't even think of. So. But because there's so much of it, the, the prices of food came down, way, way down. But there's a cost to that, that there being cheap food, and that's what we'll discuss next. Like I mentioned earlier, the Green Revolution brought a, a dependence on fertilizers, herbicides, pesticides, increased irrigation because you have bigger farms. Um, and you can see in the image there, there's just a massive amount, the lower image, all of those uh, tractors working at one time in unison. That's how big these farms are. And it also meant uh, consumes more fossil fuels, right? All those tractors require gas. This increased the cost of maintaining high yield farms. Because of the cost of maintaining big farms, there was a shift from small family farms to these larger industrial farms that specialized in one single crop, whether it be corn or soybeans or wheat, you know, you don't have sort of this rotation of crops. You know, these massive um, industrial agricultural farms are one single crop. Now, the downside of that is in the poorest nations, the Green Revolution never made it there because it was too expensive to get machines like you see in the image there. You hear you see about 15 of them in a row or so, 15, 20 of them in a row. But in the poorest nations, they can't even afford one of those 
to increase the size of their yield. So they're doing, still doing it with you know old fashioned plows either pulled by animals or maybe some rudimentary tractors from a long time ago. So the, the green revolution was great for us here in the industrialized world, but for the poorer nations, it didn't reach it there at all because they can't afford that mechanized farming. Starting in the 1970s, there were policies that were changed when it came to farming that allowed agribusinesses and, um, to grow exponentially, creating more cheaper food and consistent raw materials for food processing. This includes things like the fast food revolution, McDonald's, the Burger Kings. They were able to do that and create these franchises because the policies back in the 70s changed such that it made it much easier to get all of the resources they needed at all of the locations they wanted to open. This also included things like Coke, Nestle, General Mills. You know, General Mills makes lots of cereal. All that cereal requires grains of some sort, whether it be wheat, oat, whatever. You know, those, and so these policies that came out of the Green Revolution basically encouraged this. Now, what happened was, is rather than corporate loans, where let's say a farm, or a farm needs to pay it back, they gave out subsidies. And if you don't know what a subsidy is, that means basically they're artificially lowering the price by kicking in the money themselves. If you didn't know this, when you buy gasoline at the, at the gas station, the government subsidizes that. If they didn't, it would be one to $2 more expensive. The, the rates are artificially lowered with subsidies to make it more affordable, more affordable for the masses. So in the, in the case of the, the uh, farms, this allowed rapid expansion of larger and larger farms at the expense of, those, expense of the smaller locally owned farms. This is the same story that occurred in the retail world with the proliferation of Walmart. It's the same exact thing. So this led to factory farms for grains, meat, and poultry, as you can see in the image there. Now, the problem with the biggest, one of the biggest problems is a small group of company now controls most of the food in the US, including some of those listed above, Nestle, General Mills. They control a massive amount of the food that's being um, uh, grown in this country. Another product of the Green Revolution was the, the chemical fertilizer industry, you know, saw itself boom because you had more and more land being used for bigger and bigger farms and they needed fertilizer for that. So the companies that make the fertilizer uh, became just as big as the actual companies farming themselves. So you needed all these chemical fertilizers to maintain the high yield crops. Well, if you don't know much about farming, you have to take care of the soil, right? If you if you damage the soil, if you suck out all the nutrients out of that soil, um, you can create a real. You basically create the Dust Bowl of the 1930s. That's exactly what happened. Was poor farming practices. So th what they've done, you know, what they learned over time is you add these chemicals to the soil to keep it from becoming unable to support the crops to avoid that Dust Bowl situation. Okay, that's great. That keeps the, per the crops healthy, right? Well, the problem with that is that those fertilizers are also pollution, pollutants. Water comes down, rain for uh, irrigation comes down and it hits that land. The, the fertilizers get into the soil, but some of it also gets into the water system. And you can get what's called uh, nutrient leaching which takes the nutrients from the soil anyway, and runoff, which is what uh, non-point point, non -point uh, pollution, leading to what's called eutrophication and anoxia, or lack of oxygen. You can see in the image here, that is what's, that's Chesapeake Bay, and that's what's called an algal bloom. Because of all of the, the runoff from the farms and everything going into the water, it, all that fertilizer, which is good for growing crops, is also very, very good at growing algae to the point where it can choke off entire lakes or water systems. And that's what that is. That is not 
some like dye that is algae that's and once that algae gets to that point it chokes out fish because it's blocking out sunlight it chokes out all the other plants below it and that's what eutrophication is eutrophication is the algal bloom that creates um, this sort of blanket over the top of the water and then because of that you have anoxia which is it creates a lack of oxygen that the water can't circulate and basically kills everything underneath it, including fish. Another issue with big farms is the use of pesticides, which are synthetic chemicals used to control pests and weeds and fungal pathogens and other threats to crops. Well, that's great and all, but the problem with that is it also kills everything else around it. And in addition to that, when it's sprayed, 95% of it doesn't even get into the plant. It's all runoff, which can create the issues that you saw in the previous slide, the eutrophication and anoxia. So insecticides kill all pests, right? Not just the ones that you want to kill. They kill everything, including something like bees. And bees are hugely important. In fact, there's a huge... Uh, worldwide save the bees sort of thing because uh, they're, they're dying out way quicker than they should, partially because of climate change, partially because of this type of issue, and uh, just basically humans don't like them. <laughs> but the, the, the problem is, is insecticides kill everything. And then also, just like antibiotics, um, if you use too many antibiotics, your body develops an immunity to it and the antibiotic doesn't work. Same thing occurs with pesticides. The pests that you're trying to kill grow an immunity to the pesticides, which means you have to use more pesticide. So it's like a snowball effect. And pesticides are highly toxic. So they, they can get into fish, they can get into any animals that ingest them and it goes through the food chain. So um, if fish eat it and then you eat the fish, or let's say a deer drinks the water and a hunter gets the deer, that kind of thing. I mean, those are extreme cases, but the idea is, is these don't just whittle out of the system, uh, the, the water system, they're in there and then they get ingested and get introduced to the food chain. This slide here was kind of an eye opener for me when I first started teaching this course which is the loss of crop and genetic diversity. Now let's read this first bullet point here. There are 250 to 300 edible plants that we know of in the world, yet only about 20 of them are the bulk of the human diet, including rice, wheat, corn, soy, sorghum, barley, beans, and several root and fruit crops. So out of nearly 300 varieties, only about 20 of them actually make it into our diet. That's pretty crazy. And then on top of that, if you just look at the U.S., that's worldwide. If you look at the U.S. by itself, it's even less in terms of it's dominated by corn and soy. And, you know, I, you don't think of that, especially soy. A lot of people don't think about soy. It's used for grains, you know, soy. It's used in all kinds of things, including feed for animals. So they feed off these crops. So that's why there's so much grain and soy um grown especially across the you know the great plains kansas nebraska the dakotas it's all wheat and soybeans over the course of the human history the the number of crop varieties has dwindled and there's an image in the book that shows like 25 or so different potato varieties we might eat three of them in this country maybe four that's it you know you got your regular sort of baked russet potatoes you got yukon golds you got little red potatoes, and sometimes you can find purple potatoes. Those are interesting too. They make good potato chips. But other than that, even though there's way more variety, there's red potatoes, not sweet potatoes. That's something else. I'm talking. Uh, that's actually a tuber, I think, or some. It's some other genetic. It's it's a different plant altogether. But it's just weird that as we've evolved as humans, especially in this country with the the massive farms and everything. The number of, of types of food that we eat is dwindled down to just a handful. In the previous slide, we looked at the fact that there's only maybe a few varieties of plants actually being grown and eaten. Let's take that now and look at it from a global agricultural perspective. Because there's better refrigeration, we're able to get 
um, season fruits that are always out of that may be out of season all year long. Something you know like a pineapple or you know some weird uh, tropical fruit. We can get them all the time because they're able to be shipped much more efficiently than let's say a hundred years ago. Now these transported foods are at the, the expense of cheap labor and uh, environmental uh, relaxed environmental constraints in other countries. What do I mean by that? You know, you go to other countries and they're getting paid pennies on the dollar, pennies per hour. They might make two, three dollars a day. And, you know, we don't see that part of it, you know, like in bananas and things like that. Um, and then obviously there are practices in within the cultivation of it and the transportation of it that go above and beyond what you know you would be able to get away with in this country in terms of environmental regulations and like i mentioned bananas are a perfect example of an exotic fruit they're not found in this country maybe down way down in florida but i, I don't think so but yet they're a mainstay in our diets here in america and because of this bananas have grown there they there's areas that have had wars over this and power struggles over bananas because it's become such a huge money-making export. And that's why they, where the term Banana Republic comes from, not the clothing company. It came from Banana Republic, the fact that these, these countries were fighting with each other over who was gonna get you know, the bigger banana plantations. So a typical plate of food in the US accumulates 1,500 miles from source to table. Let's think about that for a second. Let's say I'm here in Milwaukee and I want to have a live Maine lobster. How far is Maine from here? And not only that, once you get to Maine, you're probably offshore or even more miles to get that lobster. Or maybe Alaskan king crab, like the show that used to be on or may still be on, I don't even know. You know, th that food is traveling a very long distance to get to us here in the, in the Midwest. Any type of seafood, tropical type thing like that. So 91 cents out of every dollar goes to the distributors, the marketers and et cetera, with only nine, roughly nine cents out of every dollar going to the farmers. That's insane. That's, that's crazy. But that's the, 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 uh, the entire network that's been set up with the food. Because again, Americans want what they want when they want it. So if I want a banana and I go to the grocery store, they better have bananas. And those bananas just travel a long distance from South America and Mexico to get to me. <laughs> so that's why, and that's a big, what plays a big role in that is the increased transportation requires fossil fuels and all that transportation has increased the amount of greenhouse gases. Now that's not the only thing creating greenhouse gases, but there are always planes, trains, trucks, cars, carrying food everywhere. You see them all the time to restaurants, to supermarkets, okay? The, the, the food is always in transit, 24-7, 365. And it's always being transported in gasoline type vehicles or planes or trains or whatever it is. So yes, it is, it's a huge role in the greenhouse gases being emitted. You can't discuss global food issues without discussing meat and animal uh, product consumption. Now, I eat meat. I'm not a vegetarian. So I'm just speaking from the perspective of what's going on. Not necessarily that I've taken big steps to help fix it myself. So I don't want to want anybody to think, you know, I'm not trying to sound like a hypocrite here, but meat consumption, especially in developing countries has tripled because those countries are developing themselves, especially let's say a middle class. And then because of that middle class, they want better meals. And those meals often include meat. It's no different than in this country country with things like steakhouses and stuff like that. The problem is, is that it's a known fact that meat and animal products require more resources and land compared to crop resource production. Because not only do you need the crops to feed the animals, you need areas for the animals to roam and graze along with all the water that goes with it and the land. So the, the land is led, the, the need for the land has led to de massive deforestation in places like the Amazon rainforest. And you can see that in the upper image there where it's just sort of butted right up against the rainforest. That is the Amazon. They just clear cut it to, 
to make way for cattle because cattle allows them to actually make money. The rainforest isn't allowing them to make money. Now we understand it from a sustainability and from a climate change point of view that those rainforests are hugely important. But from their perspective, they're just trying to eke out a living and make, you know, make a living and make some money. So to them, clearing that out for cattle, just it's a no brainer. They don't even realize what's actually going on. Now meat produces uh, or uh, meat consumption and production produces greenhouse gases such as methane. <laughs> you know, cars, uh, cows and pigs and everything, they toot a lot. And that's methane pr uh, production that's released up into the atmosphere. Now that may seem silly when you first think about it, but you gotta understand some of these factory farms have thousands and thousands and thousands of cows. And then you take that and you put it all over the place you're talking millions and millions, even in here in Wisconsin, we're the dairy state. We got a lot of cows in Wisconsin. That's a lot of methane being generated. Um, there are some technologies that are they're trying to develop to capture that methane, so to speak, but that, that's a whole different ball of wax, so to speak. When it comes to food and animal products, a big hot button topic becomes the genetically modified organisms or GMOs. And what that is, is any organism whose genetic material has been altered using genetic engineering techniques. What does that mean? Well, it means, you know, artificially creating a more hardy version of this or a better tasting version of that. Um, it allows for higher yields, increased nutritional quality, decreased in, uh, dependency on pesticides. So they can actually genetically engineer these things, these crops so that the bugs don't like them. <laughs> um, I don't understand how that works, but okay. Roughly 80% of the crops grown in the US contain GMOs, especially corn and soy. Now you'll see more and more often, you'll see um, packaging for various products saying, uh, you know, non-GMO, non-GMO. So there is a slight push, big pushback being done against GMOs to have the farms and that go back to sort of your standard non-GMO type of grains. Um, there is not right now any definitive evidence that GMOs are bad for humans. Um, that's a misconception. Uh, the, the research just doesn't prove it. Now, psychologically, there are people out there that are going to say, why would I want something that's been genet genetically modified in my body? I can't fault them for that. But the scientific evidence as of right now says there is no significant health to, uh, risk to humans. So, you, you know, that's a, an opinion based thing right now. Here's a table of foods that shows which are currently being genetically modified and which of those have not may not have been approved yet. Um, things like there you have sweet corn, more than 70% of the gro corn grown in the US has been genetically engineered. Whereas tomatoes have been modified, but they are not being grown commercially yet. You know, salmon, look at salmon, has, been, has not been approved by the FDA, but it will be very soon. So, I mean, there's a lot of things that are already genetically modified and it just seems like for most people though, they either don't realize it or they don't care, you know, or, so look at soy, for example, more than 93% of soybeans in this, the States are genetically modified. Again, all that remains is that for these types of crops is to make them give higher yields so they can have more than one harvest in a, in a season or um, make them Im more immune to uh, pesticide or pests so they don't have to use pesticides or insecticides, things like that. Um, th however, again, let me re repeat what I said on the last slide. There's no evidence right now that this poses any threat whatsoever to human health. There are some drawbacks to GMOs. The first being that the yields per unit area have not significantly increased as promised. But what has happened is it's allowed crops to be grown in areas once not possible. If you're the farmer, this is a good thing. You know, you get more crops. But the problem is, is it's destroying habitats because areas that 
you know, once might have been uh, kind of swampy can now be, you know, used for farming because of these GMOs. You could create uh, genetic strains that allow it to uh, be hardier for where it's being planted at the, the expense of the habitats that are being uh, left behind. Another big one is the use of Roundup. Now we've all you seen, you've probably seen Roundup before. It's a weed killer, and I've used it myself. Um, I didn't know that before I did this course, but what Roundup allowed you to do is spray it on right, the weeds right around the crops. So before you had to do your weeding, then planting. You couldn't, you know, you couldn't put weed killer down and then plant because it would kill the plants. Well, Roundup was designed so such that you could spray it anywhere. It'll kill the weeds, but it won't harm the plants. The problem is, is it gets into the aquatic systems and creates uh, nasty side effects, especially with amphibians. And then on top of that, to make matters worse, it's been linked to cancer in humans as well. Um, I think you can still buy Roundup, but there's definitely a big warning label on it now. And I've seen those goofy infomercials with, you know, have you used Roundup and all this stuff? So um, be aware, but that's what, you know, that was one of those products that was de designed to do something good and it had unintended consequences. And finally, you have something called transboundary pollution, kind of like what we talked about with air pollution, but with GMO markers. What does that mean? That means, let's say you have wind or erosion and bits and pieces of genetically modified material are blowing over into a farmer's field next door who has said, no, I'm not going the GMO route and they can get into his farm. This has happened, it is an issue. Um, all it takes is you know, a little bit of germination or a pollinator or something like that to take a GMO product, move it over to a field and all of a sudden now that GMO will start to spread over time into that field as well. And that, just like we mentioned with air, um, air pollution, this is a form of transboundary pollution. Okay, let's take a look at some sustainable food solutions. So we've talked about sort of the big agriculture and what's being done to produce food on massive scales. But there are other options and a lot more of these options are taking root, so to speak, in, uh, in farms all over the world, let alone just the United States. So let's go ahead and take a look at some of those. Although to some, you might think agri uh, organic agriculture is kind of a new thing, it's actually started being employed way back in the early 1900s. So certain organic farmers saw that link between the soil and the healthy food that it created and using you know, um, methods of farming that have been around for thousands of years to keep the soil in good condition, fertile, and replenish it with uh, organic matter. And you do this, one of the big things is by crop rotation. You can see in the image here that you have this field with several different kinds of crops in rows, rather than all one single big corn field, for, just for example, using corn. And what that does is it allows the different uh, plants to rejuvenate the soil in different ways by you know adding or subtracting nutrients and it um then what you would do is the next year you would rotate these around to to allow the plants to do their thing in different spots and this reduces erosion it reduces uh, organic matter loss or acidification so just by switching crops around um, and using organic composting which is just taking a big bucket and putting it out in the backyard and putting all your organic matter in there and let, basically let it naturally convert into soil. Um, it takes all of that and it allows the, the ground to stay fertile all the time. And it eliminates the use of fertilizers and pesticides because you can use other things like you can use uh, cover fabrics or insecticidal soaps and oils um, which are, uh, they're sort of a natural oil or even dead bacteria to help keep everything at bay, all those little nasties. So there's ways to get around that. Is it a perfect system? No, it's not. But there, you know, organic food is just that. It's the, the, the definition of it is that it's untouched by man, so to speak. 
So they're, they're not spraying anything on it. They're not doing anything like that. They're letting everything grow naturally and then using things like crop rotation and um, uh, organic composting. It allows the, the true flavors to come out. It, allow, it allows the soil to stay fertile and allows everything to uh, sort of keep everything rolling without the use of much by man. Anytime you have a shift in sort of philosophy for anything, you're gonna have questions raised. And there are people out there that are skeptical about the concerns, you know, about organic farming in general. Are the crops actually healthier? Well, there have been many studies done and there are certain aspects um, that come with eating organic foods. Are the nutritional values higher? I, I honestly don't know. I'd have, you'd have to go look in the research. But just from a sort of a, a background look, you can imagine that it, you're, you're not going to come into contact with some of those insecticides and pesticides with organic foods. Is organic farming better for the environment? Well, you'd like to think so because organic farming by definition is allowing the food to take hold on its own and utilizing those techniques to keep everything fertile. So you would think it would be better for the environment. It requires less irrigation, less tilling, all of those things. Can organic agriculture generate yields needed for existing and rapidly expanding populations? Well, the answer to that, at least right now, is probably no. Um, the thing with the big uh, farms, you know, the big agri uh, factory farms is that they have the ability to do things on such a massive scale, whereas organic farms just don't have that because it requires more labor, hand labor, you know, human uh, interaction rather than uh, mechanization. And uh, so probably not. However, there are many more options. And with more people delving into organic farming, there are a lot more choices, which you could go all the way back to the, the slide where we talked about food deserts and that's one of the things that's taking place. You're, you're finding organic farming in urban areas, urban farms. They'll find little plots of land here and there and they'll do this and bring it to a, a place that would normally not have uh, available fruits and vegetables. So will it feed everybody worldwide? Probably not, but does it help? Absolutely. Are organic crops healthier? Like I mentioned in the previous slide, there's a lot of debate over that. Um, the main thing, like I mentioned, is that they have less pesticide residue than sort of processed foods. Um, that's the main thing. You know, uh, nutritionally, they're probably about the same. Um, that you know, but you have to know that you're getting that if you're not buying organic, or to make sure you're washing your fruits and vegetables off before you eat them. That's a big thing, obviously. Um, I'm, I try to do that all the time. I do forget sometimes, I admit. Um, but uh, that's the main thing that's come out of a lot of the research is not necessarily is there a better nutritional value, but you don't have those uh, pesticide residues, all those chemical residues on the organic food. There is considerable evidence, like I mentioned earlier, that organic farming is better for the environment. I mean, it, it makes sense. You have la you don't have all the toxic chemicals that are used that create non-point pollution, and you have lower fossil fuel usage because there's less mechanization. It's more done by hand on smaller plots of land. Um, and another huge one is organic grass-fed beef systems have reduced fossil fuel by 50%. So there's a lot of advantages in terms of the environment for organic farming. On this diagram here, we see the differences between conventional and organic farming compared to each other in different facets. So you have the yield. Yes, there are smaller yields um, for organic, but the, and the nutritional quality is roughly the same. You have reduced uh, worker exposure to pesticides and employment of workers, whereas you have fewer workers in the big farms because they have all the machines you have better soil quality, you have better energy use, better biodiversity with organic farming. So there's a lot of positives. Um, the only 
slight negative really would be the, the only slightly smaller yields. Um, but you know, organic can hang. I know I mentioned earlier it's not there yet, but it can hang with conventional farming techniques as long as you have everything in place. You got to have obviously the workers to do it and everything else. Another alternative to sort of your typical uh, agricultural techniques are things like hydroponics, aquaculture, and aquaponics. So what are those? Well, hydroponics is a branch of uh, agriculture where the plants are grown without any soil whatsoever. The nutrients in the plants get dissolved in the water. So the, are, the, the, the roots are just exposed to nutrient-rich water and they are suspended in that. This allows the farming to take place where there's no arable land. So you'll start, you're starting to see this in like urban areas where you don't have big plots of land to grow things on. So that they'll use old buildings or whatever to start uh, hydroponic farms. Now aquaculture is farming of fish and seafood, but it's not sustainable. So you can use this newer system that you require that allows for a closed loop. So you'll, you can see that in the second picture there, or the, the, um, where you have water flowing through, recirculating, and use a lot less water to actually uh, water the um, plants. So think of it sort of like plants sitting on a river and you just keep the river flowing. You use the same amount of water, you just add some nutrients to the water and the water keeps going around feeding all of the plants. Um, or the fish. And the same thing applies with aquaponics, which is a combination of plants and fish together. So you can see in that bottom picture, you have uh, plants being grown with fish at the same time. So the fish, you know, they pee and poop, right, <laughs> in the water. That Those are nutrients that the plants can use. So it's self-sustaining. The fish are helping the plants grow and the water is helping the fish grow. So everything's sort of a, this closed loop and you're killing sort of two birds with one stone, getting both plants out of it and fish out of it. One of the things that's, you know, become quite popular, especially with, you know, organic farms is buying local and small. So you see this in areas like West Dallas and some other areas around town, you have these farmers markets where they'll bring their, their fruits and vegetables to a sort of a central area and sell them. And um, you know this is a great way to support local farms. It, it allows them to be more productive, get some, you know, make a profit. And most of the time this stuff is already organic. They're not spraying it. They don't have the means to spray it or they'll just tout themselves as an organic farm. Um, you can actually get these on regional scales too. Um, now what's weird is in less developed areas of the world, this has been going on for millennia, right? <laughs> they, they don't have all of the transportation infrastructure to travel with their fruits and vegetables all over. You know, you have that one little farm, they sell their stuff in town and it's been done that way for thousands of years probably. Now, the other thing with that is you might have heard the term farm to table. And um, what that is, is the same idea that the, the chefs at these restaurants are buying local fruits, vegetables, meats, fish, everything locally from somebody where it's not traveling all over the country. Now, you can't do that for everything, but they're trying to buy as much pot as possible. Uh, and a lot of like, especially high end restaurants, they buy what they need for the menu that day. Um, that may seem foreign to a lot of restaurants that have the same menu every day. You know, you go to an Applebee's, you know what you're going to get. It's not like that at the real high-end restaurants. They'll actually go and buy their food for that day for that menu, and then the menu changes the next day. So what they're doing is they're utilizing this farm to table. They're by um, asking small growers of fruits and vegetables and fish and all those kinds of things that, you know, to hook them up, so to speak. And uh, then they can tout themselves as this farm to table, which is a real, real selling point for a lot of people as well. Here's an example of a type of farming that's starting to take traction, especially in highly urbanized areas. And you can see in the first bullet point there, 80% of Earth's population now resides in urban areas. 
roughly. I mean, it's a little less than that, but they said by 2050. So people are moving out of the rural areas and moving to the urban areas because that's where the money is, that's where the jobs are. So how do you sustain that with food if fewer people are farming? Well, one option of that is what they call urban agriculture and vertical farming. You can see sort of in the background image and in the inset image, these farms that are uh, utilizing verti the verticality going up as opposed to out and about and using hydro, uh, hydroponics, LED lighting, and uh, I hydro aquaponics, excuse me, these sustainable closed loop systems that allow them to grow food without the use of necessarily the sun with the LED lighting, because uh, they're getting the same wavelengths. And you can do it on almost any vertical or semi-vertical slope type thing, it, you know, in domes, skyscrapers, all that kind of stuff, greenhouses. And so this could be more done more in the future. It's not like everywhere yet, but this is something as the populations gravitate towards the urban areas, which they already have, um, this is something that's gonna become more and more prevalent. Let's change gears here a little bit here and talk about fair trade. There are certain crops such as coffee, cocoa beans, and bananas that are grown in very specific climates outside of our own country, but are hugely popular here. I mean, everybody drinks coffee. I don't drink coffee, but a lot of people drink coffee. Not only are these popular um, in terms of what they're used for, like cocoa beans with chocolate and everything, but these crops are very labor intensive. You're talking picking bean by bean for coffee or bean by bean for cocoa beans. It's very, very uh, labor intensive work. Um, and then not only that, globally, the prices are depressed because there's such a, a flood of coffee, there's a flood of cocoa beans. So the prices are very cheap. Now the whole goal to fair trade is to ensure that the, the people doing the work actually get a fair compensa compensation. Now in years past, I mentioned in a previous slide, the banana republics, where you had you know entire countries or regions going to war over the exports of these types of things. Um, you know, you want to be able to, what the connoisseurs have sort of demanded is that the people doing the work for to cultivate these crops are being treated fairly, including a, a, a fair wages and labor conditions. And a big one that came out of fair trade is, you know, these making sure that child labor laws are being enforced because there's, you know, protecting basic human rights you know, making sure that when you drink that cup of coffee, you can feel good about the fact that the people who picked those beans got paid to do so and paid to do so fairly. Now, fair trade also attempts to promote long-term business relationships. So you'll see certain roasters, you know, um, make agreements with certain farms because they are in a fair trade agreement. So this produces a win-win situation for both the, the, the producer and the buyer because then that way they both know that they're in this sort of long-term agreement. Now, the, what is the, I, the, um, the prices of these types of things are higher. And that's, that is the truth. Fair trade coffee is gonna cost more than non-fair trade coffee. However, those who are buying it are doing so to make sure that they're, you know, they understand that they're willing to pay that price to promote social justice, to ensure that, you know, they're getting paid fairly, there's no child labor involved, and there's environmental protections being met. So this is where a lot of this comes in. And, you know, it started really with coffee that I know of, but it's become even more prevalent with some of those other cash crops like bananas and cocoa beans, because, you know, again, there's a lot of labor involved with those. Another alternative to sort of the big agriculture is something called permaculture. Now, you've seen this, probably seen this before with flowers, right? There are annuals and there are perennials. So annuals are flowers that you plant every year to make your area look pretty, and then they die, and then you gotta replant them next year. Then there are perennials, which pop up every year, regardless of whether you want them to or not. I have some in my backyard that I actually covered over with rocks and stuff, and they bloop, popped right up through, right through all my stuff. Um, they're pretty when they happen, but 
uh, like tulip. Tulips are perennials. So the idea is, is to use crops that are perennial crops as opposed to ones that have to be uh, grown every year. And this, now this isn't possible for everything, but there are some that allow that to do that. There are some crops that allow you to do that. And what this does is it allows the ground to, uh, the, the extensive root structure to stay there, which helps better soil, uh, maintain better soil sustainability and water filtering and things like that. So this is just, it's a small thing. It's not done a ton, but it is an option as well as using plants that pop up every year as opposed to those that need to be uh, planted every year. I mentioned this earlier as well. You know, there's a growing movement on at least reducing amount, the, the amount of meat you eat, um, let's say over a week or something like that. Um, animals require a lot of food and water to keep alive to grow and everything like that. They also need large grazing areas, which we talked about with the deforestation of the rainforest. And they produce things like methane just by eating the grass in their digestive system. There is a difference that can be made just by reducing the amount of meat even a little bit would allow, reduce the amount of energy used to raise the animals. Um, you know, I am not a vegetarian, but I actually don't mind eating meatless meals. Um, for example, I make, uh, I make um, maticotti or lasagna and I put spinach in mine. I don't put meat in mine. That was just a decision I made years ago with my wife and we just, I enjoy it. I, I like spinach. That's something I enjoy. So, you know, that's just one, a, one option. Do I eat, we eat meat? Yes. Do we eat meat every day? We eat meat a lot. But you know there are sometimes you just want a salad or you want something light, and there's nothing wrong with that. You know maybe and it probably would go a little ways for someone like me who could probably use a use to lose a few pounds as well. Another option is to return to your roots as hunters, gatherers, and growers. Um, is everybody going to do that? No, and this contradicts completely the slide we saw earlier about roughly 80% of the people moving into urban areas by 2050. Um, the, the problem with that is, is it's really hard to go out all the time and do this kind of thing. Um, you know, a lot of people just aren't meant for that. You know, they're, they're just, over the course of human history, or at least in this country, we've grown to rely on things like supermarkets, gas stations, convenience, all of that. There are those that hunt, you know, here in Wisconsin, hunting is a big deal. It's not something I do. I have nothing against it. I just didn't kind of grow up with it. Um, and so, you know, there is something to be said. There's a huge market for things like fresh mushrooms and stuff like that, that you see, you know, up in the, the top picture there. Uh, you know, it, there's, there's, there are ways of doing this. However, you know, the problem is, is, you know, to get out into the real wild, you have to be ways away from people and you have to have permission to do so. So just, you know, unless if you're out in the middle of nowhere, Alaska, or maybe areas in Montana, you can't just go, you know, shoot, shoot animals. You're going to get in trouble by it. You're considered a poacher. So you got to be careful with that kind of thing. So this isn't, while it's a viable, sustainable option, it's really not a, a realistic one for most people in this day and age. Another thing that you can do for sustainability is allowing for food diversity. All that means is introducing foods into your diet that might not have already been there before um, to eat a wider variety of crops. Now, this is a plus and a minus if you like them, obviously. Um, you know, there are certain things that are just not too hip in our culture that might be in another culture. And I, I wish I could remember what the, that bottom slide was. I forgot what that is. But the top one you might recognize is quino or quino. I don't even know how you pronounce it. There's pluses and minuses to food diversity. So if you look at the third, um, you have benefits and, and drawbacks. When people realize the nutritional benefits then all of a sudden people, you get on this kick, right? You know, what it used to be sun dried tomatoes, which is I think what the bottom one was. Um, sun dried tomatoes were all the rage. You don't hear about them too much anymore. Now it's all 
Kino, Kino this and Kino, Kino that. And um, the problem is, is the people that have eaten it indigenously for years, now they have to pay a higher price for it because there's high demand for it. So once, for example, you know, America has huge buying power. If there's some fad or food that becomes seriously popular here, people eat it up. And right now, that's one of them. Kino is one of them. So the problem is, is that inflates the price. So people that have been eating Kino for years, let's say in, in Europe or wherever it's grown originally, I think it's a Middle Eastern grain, um, they have to now pay a higher price for it because of everybody eating it here in our country. So it, it's it's a it's a weird dynamic in that regard. It's all about fads, though. So you know, uh, there's a all the, those those berries in the background had another um, story behind them, similar to the quinoa. I don't remember what those are uh, when I made these slides. I wish I could remember. Here's a slide that is both eye-opening and makes me feel a bit guilty, like I mentioned in an earlier slide. Let's read this slide. 1.3 billion tons, B, billion tons of food is wasted each year globally. That is a lot of food. Um, now, in our country, just speaking for the U.S., we waste so much food. Think about every time you go to a restaurant. You know, in America, we want bigger, better, better, right? So we get all of this food with every meal. I'm not picking on Red Lobster because I absolutely love Red Lobster, but let's pick on Red Lobster for a second. You get the biscuits at the table. Those are really good, aren't they? You get the biscuits. Then you get a salad. Then you get a potato. <laughs> oh, then you get your meal and usually like another pasta or rice or something on there. You get a lot of food. My wife can't eat all that. And even though she likes the food, she can't eat all of everything they give you. So it, it is it is pretty crazy how much food gets wasted. And like I mentioned in an earlier slide, my family's guilty and I hate it. Um, however, restaurants and cafeterias are major contributors to this, but there's a growing movement to help utilize the, those, those um, scraps for things like homeless shelters, and rather than just throw it out, donating it, a lot of it. Um, and that, that's, that, that's become a huge thing as well. GMOs and sustainability kind of go hand in hand here. There has been, it's been suggested that since GMOs work so well at creating high yield crops in areas like America, right, industrialized nations, why not bring that over to, um, areas that don't have the GMOs. And part of the problem with that is the GMOs, that's proprietary property. It's, they're owned by a company. So there's, just like in so software, there's, a, there's been a push to create open source GMOs that would be free to use. Just like you have Windows, like I'm using a, a computer with Windows on it right now, you also have Linux, which is open source. You can download it for free, you can tinker with it, you can do all kinds of stuff with it. I love Linux, by the way. Um, and so that allows you to tinker with things. So that might be a viable option going down the road is uh, being able to have these open source um, uh, GMOs and when you have open source, what it does is it promotes promotes creativity. It promotes innovation. When you let people look under the hood of it, all of a sudden they say, hey, we can do this, 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 and this. And pretty soon you have even more innovation. But right now, a lot of those GMOs are highly guarded by companies that developed them. An often overlooked aspect of sustainability on a global scale is that in many developing countries, women have no ability to help farm because they're taking care of the children. Now with the advent in many developing nations of better childcare, this allows women to take a greater role in the farming in improving food security. So this allows women better access to better seeds um, and fertilizers and then productivity. And the research really suggests, it indicates that you can increase yields by 30% just 
just by allowing women to have access to these farms. Now that seems weird to us in our world, but in the rest of the world, there are very, very uh, specific roles for the men and the women. And in, in many developing nations, the women's role is to take care of the children. The men go out and do the farming or you know whatever they're doing. Well, the men can only do so much. You know, if you allow the women to help as well because the children are being looked after, all of a sudden you've just created an, a 30% increase in productivity, which allows for better food security, you know, allowing more crops to be grown. So again, this is a developing nation uh, type of thing, but it's definitely an issue in many areas. With the climate changing um, as we speak, there's lots of aspects to agriculture that need to be taken account of for. You're gonna have things like greater droughts or heavier storms and areas like landlocked countries and oceanic islands are particularly at risk. If you have rising sea levels, that's the islands. Um, and if you have areas that are far from oceans or far from um, any sources of moisture, you're gonna have longer and hotter droughts. We're seeing that actually in the Western US. So things like taro, which is used a lot in some areas of the world, it takes a long time to grow. And if it gets flooded, it can, you know, your next crop might be five years out. So because of this, if that's your main source of food is this taro crop, then a, a good option for combating uh, climate change is um, the crop diversification, introducing different types of foods that might be able to withstand the slightly higher, drier periods, uh, you know, of higher temperatures and drier areas, or if something gets flooded, um, it won't take as long to recover from. So crop diversification is one way to help uh, mitigate the effects of global warming. So there's a global effort to help assess food system sustainability. Um, this comes all the way from uh, chapter one, we saw it. Um, it was actually a question on the test. Food security requires that all three of these be met, environmental issues, economic issues, and social issues. Now that's always not possible everywhere, but the areas where all three of those are taken into account or generally have the best um, uh, sustainable food systems, like here in the US. We have a good environment, we have a great economic structure and we're not under some kind of like revolt yet. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> we're not under any kind of revolt. So that these need to be taken into account where they can be measurable, relevant, and you know, there's decision making that's taking place to always have these three main goals in mind when it comes to agriculture or sustainable food systems. Throughout this chapter, we've talked about food systems and making them more sustainable. And with any food system, you're gonna have barriers that are that need to be overcome. So a few of those are include something like the argument that the only viable method is local growers when there's not enough land in urban areas to sustain this model. And that is exactly what, you know, we saw the slide where 80% of the population by 2050 is gonna be in urban areas. Well, there's not enough land in urban areas to sustain all of those billions of people. So that can't be the only viable option. Another barrier is that GMOs are bad and they should be banned when they could in fact contribute to food security and increased nutrition. And we saw that in this a couple slides ago where GMOs have, there's as of right now, no link to them being bad for humans. And especially in developing nations where they really need that help, they could really boost um, food security and in increase the nutrition that those people have in those parts of the world. Another big barrier is that advocates become narrow focused and caught on a cause rather than a solution. So, you know, they're fighting for organic farming, but they don't see the bigger picture other than that. They get focused on one specific thing, whether it be GMOs or organic farming or pesticides or whatever it is, and it becomes sort of a, 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 it, it becomes a, a cause, their cause, rather than trying to figure out the solution to that issue. 
And finally, just blatantly dismissing big farms instead of trying to figure out how to make big farms more sustainable. Big farms aren't going anywhere. It's big multi-billion dollar businesses, all right, that feed the world essentially. However, there are probably ways that may have not even become available yet to make those farms better, more, you know, less reliant on pesticides and, and insecticides, better crop um, yields, better soil maintaining, all of those things. There, there's, and they're working on that stuff. Like I said, the agriculture business is massive. It is huge. So in, in a nutshell, the best approach is to look at a wide variety of options and implement those that seem viable, especially for the needs of the people who are being directly affected by it. So for example, if GMOs are going to help those people open, like I mentioned earlier, open source GMOs, to allow higher yields in areas where they have little or no yields now, that's a no brainer. Let them have at it. Get those seeds in there, get planting and let them you know, get the food. On the flip side of that, you, there has to be better ways of big farming you know, right now, whether that be <clears throat> making the machines that harvest everything electric, maybe down the road, there'll be electric threshers and electric this and you know, where, fossil fuel usage becomes a non-issue. So there you're taking all the fossil fuels out of the equation and that may, that's a huge step forward for sustainable farming. All right, I actually really enjoyed this chapter um, and I hope you did too. I learned a lot when I first started teaching this course about all of this and there's some eye-opening numbers and you'll see some more eye-opening numbers in the ch chapters to come as well. So, all right, that's it, take care. Talk to you later.